I have on my right here Neil Connery from ITV, who's been in the Yemen very recently reporting from the ground. Tell me what the situation is, Neil. It's desperate, Peter. We were there first of all in March earlier on this year and things were bad enough then. We returned in October and you could really see the impact. The warnings that people were giving earlier on this year about the trajectory of this crisis really was becoming true. This is a man-made humanitarian catastrophe unfolding. You could see the effects of hunger, malnutrition, severe malnutrition, some of the villages we went to out in the West. Uh, people just throwing their children up in front of us. Babies just, you could see the, the rib cages bursting through their skin. That was the, the level of desperation that people are facing in Yemen. Now why is it, Hugh Fenton from the Red Cross, why is it that, what's the problem of getting food to these villages? Civil wars are the most difficult type of war to deliver humanitarian aid in. Uh, there's no clear front lines. There are isolated pockets which are accessible one day and may not be accessible the next. So it's critically important that we keep trying to deliver the, what's needed through many different mechanisms. One way will not always work, but if different agencies work together to try to uh, achieve the supplies that are needed, then things can be done. Has the world been giving enough so far? Definitely not. Uh, Yemen is a ma one of the major humanitarian catastrophes we have at the moment. One of the real problems we have in Yemen is that this is the poorest country in the Middle East. It started out at a very low level and with the massive destruction, with the massive uh, disruption to trading networks, to food supplies, the people with already very little ability to cope have found life much, much harder. Yes, I was there um, in July and it was very striking that basically all the bridges had been destroyed as you drove around the country, so there were huge pile-ups of trucks. Is that what you discovered and, and what were the difficulties of getting aid therefore to, to places which desperately needed it? Absolutely. You take the port of Hodeida, which is in the west of Yemen, I think you were there as well. You could yeah. see the, the cranes there, the loading cranes and unloading cranes which had been bombed during this conflict. The effect that that is having on shipping coming in, trying to unload aid, is creating a huge delays, huge problems in terms of getting aid in. It can get in in certain areas, but it, it really does add to the problems that the agencies and the charities are facing in terms of trying to help people who desperately need this right now. This is something that is unfolding as we speak, and unless these agencies get the help they need, the, the dire warnings that people were making earlier on this year, they're coming true now. I dread to think what lies ahead in the months ahead unless people respond to this appeal. So what you're saying is that the humanitarian crisis, I saw it for myself, it was pretty terrible, is only just beginning. I think in a way you're right and, and that's as bad as it is. I mean yeah. to, to call this a beginning, yeah. I dread to think yeah. what the middle and end game of this is. But I, I fear unless the world wakes up, as Hugh was saying, you know, Yemen has has been ignored, it hasn't received the attention. Clearly there are other conflicts, wars going on that also receive attention, but Yemen doesn't seem to break through in that way, and yet the need there is absolutely real and urgent. Why is it that the, the world seems so blind to what's going on? Because after all, this is a country which ought to be very close to our hearts. The Brits were there for 300 years. I'm not sure the Yemenis wanted us all that much, but we, we were there. <laughs> it's an area of great importance. Uh, I think the issue is there are so many different conflicts happening at the moment. As journalists know very well, it's very hard to get uh, accurate and timely information out of Yemen. And as a result, uh, it doesn't get the, the media attention that it so desperately deserves. And of course, no one is pretending that humanitarian assistance will solve the problems in Yemen. We desperately need a political solution. And all agencies like the British Red Cross do is provide a short-term humanitarian band-aid, while the much more important political solution is found. Why is it proving so difficult to get a political solution? After all, the Saudi Arabia is uh, heavily involved and is an ally of Britain. Uh, the UAE uh, is heavily involved, an ally of us. Well, what's the problem? Uh, as you know, it's a very complex conflict because of the geopolitics of the region. I think that is what complicates it, to be, to, to be direct about it. But in a way, you know, we've had seven attempts at a ceasefire, all of which have failed. But there is a real urgent need for a, a political solution. Clearly, that would make a huge difference on the ground. Um, but 
Even if there was a solution overnight, we'd still wake up tomorrow with millions of people facing these needs. That's why this appeal is crucial. You must feel very frustrated. What's the one thing the Red Cross would say we need to do now? The main thing is to make sure that all parties to the conflict have much greater attention to international humanitarian law, the protection of women and children, of civilians that are caught up in this conflict. As I mentioned, it's, it's a conflict without a front line, and it's very easy to find that the target of, uh, of military action becomes civilians. And so, as the Red Cross, we're always appealing you know, to all sides of the conflict to please remember uh, international humanitarian law and protect, put protection of civilians, protection of hospitals, protection of medical workers, right up the front of everything we do. One of the things which really struck me while I was there, I went right up to the north, Sides are, is you know you passed so many uh, displaced people in the, the pathetic little tents. They weren't being looked after. There they were on the side of roads, and, and they were viewed quite often with hostility by the local communities. Their position was really desperate, and there wasn't that sort of big organised relief at this stage at all. These were makeshift camps. That's definitely the case. There's far too delayed getting into Yemen. It's very hard to reach certain areas. We also have to recognise that different people in Yemen have different problems. Uh, as I mentioned, the medical system has almost collapsed. Uh, less than half the hospitals are currently functioning in Yemen. Food prices are going up, so even the people's meagre resources of their own matching fewer and fewer of their needs. So it's critically important that all agencies increase their efforts. Uh, efforts of delivering cash, delivering food, delivering medicines, and also, of course, delivering the medical services that are so desperately required. You know, the hospitals, I was so struck going to the hospitals, the lack of some medical supplies. I mean, the doctors were saying 10 or 20 people are dying every day in this hospital because we're not getting the, the right stuff. The thing is, if you have an earthquake or a tsunami, people can instantly see its, its impact. They can see television pictures, they get it, they understand it. When you have 20 months, grinding months of a war, it's, it's very hard to see how that plays out, but we are seeing how it plays out on the health system, in terms of food security, in so many areas, the social fabric of Yemen has effectively been ripped apart by this war with everything that entails. The hospitals, they're just not getting the medicines, the, 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 the necessary equipment and the machinery, ordinary illnesses aren't being dealt with, that means they become crisis. Well, the hospitals should be a place of safety to begin with. As, as we know, hospitals and clinics have found themselves receiving fire uh, and airstrikes from a lot of the various parties involved in this conflict. And that on its own, if people don't feel safe going to the hospital, but even when they get there, as you say, the medicines aren't there, the doctors have, you know, are trying to do the best they can to try and you know, meet the needs that, that they're overwhelmed by. Um, as a, a health system, it is, it, it's beyond breaking point, Peter. Yeah, you mean, Minister Medicine and South Frontier had to pull out of the north, didn't they? Because they kept on being struck by airstrikes and it just became impossible for them to operate. And you know how brave Medicine and South Frontier are. They are the bravest of the brave when it comes to giving aid and they couldn't operate. So that just tells you what a terrible situation it is. Tell me, give me a bit more information about what the Red Cross is doing. The British Red Cross is part of the worldwide network of yeah. Red Cross and Red Crescent societies. So in Yemen, the two, the two ways we operate is firstly through the Yemeni Red Crescent, who of course has been there for forever, for the, since the 1960s, working uh, with the Yemeni people. The Yemeni Red Crescent operates hospitals, supports ambulances, delivers food, provides water supply. So that's a long-established organisation that has absolute networks into every part of Yemeni society. So they have the ability to operate in many places that uh, an outside organisation like the British Red Cross will be unable to. The other, of course, important part is the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, who has a, a worldwide mandate to work in, uh, in conflict and humanitarian crises caused by conflict. The ICRC has an incredibly important program in Yemen, working with a very big medical program with uh, surgical hospitals, support to clinics, uh, support to ambulances again. They also work to try to re-establish water supply systems. We hear of cholera uh, in uh, Yemen. Of course, cholera is just a symptom of a collapse of a medical system, collapse of a water supply system. So 
both these agencies are working incredibly hard to try to continue the work that they do. And of course, lastly, the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross works directly with combatants to try to make sure they're obeying the humanitarian law, not targeting hospitals or civilians. I'd very much like to thank ITN and the Red Cross for coming in and sharing your experiences. It's such an important thing to do. So thank you very much, gentlemen.